Hi everyone, we are very happy to have Viola Juda from University of Chicago, also the host of Not Another Politics podcast. Uh, so she's going to be <laughs> presenting her work uh, on policy stability versus responsiveness trade-off. We only have 90 minutes. Uh, the attendees can ask questions through Q&A, and I'm going to keep an eye on that and try to interrupt at the okay, right Okay, yeah. So I, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to be paying attention to the chat, so if you could tell me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me here. Uh, it's great to be in Ankara. Um, so... Um, this is a project with Antoine Lepper, who has been my co-author for many, many years. And it's also a project that fits very uh, closely into our, uh, our research agenda. So basically in our, let me just, okay. In our um, research, we, we try to ask one basic question, which is do policies change over time in an optimal way? So we know that circumstances change, preferences of the voters change, external shocks occur, and we would like policies to adapt to this changing environment. And to what extent different types of governments in different environments uh, fulfill this uh, goal. So in this paper, we're asking this question in a particular setting, which we think is actually um, quite relevant in many applications. So what is the setting? We are going to have a voter who cares about two things. So first of all, she will care about responsiveness to shocks. So for example, she might have some preferences over taxation, but uh, she might, um, if, if she sees that there's a fiscal crisis, she might wanna raise taxes in order to pay back the debt. And in other situations, she might wanna uh, lower the taxes. At the same time, we are going to assume that the voter cares about policy stability. So all as equal, she would like the policy to stay in place. So if there are no shocks to the environment, she would like taxes to be the same every period. And given that this is, uh, this is a novel assumption that we are making in a sense that we've never made this uh, before in our model. And also there's quite, uh, that, there's very little in this literature on policy stability. I just wanna give you a quote that will try to convince you that policy stability is very important for um, the constituencies. So here's a quote from 2019 the world's largest automakers warned President Trump on Thursday that one of his most sweeping deregulatory efforts, efforts his plan to weaken tailpipe pollution standards, threatens to cut their profits and produce untenable instability in the crucial manufacturing sector. In a letter signed by 17 companies, the automakers asked Mr. Trump to go back to the negotiating table on the planned rollback of one of President Barack Obama's signature policies to fight climate change. So the story you have here is Trump to try to, uh, to make a policy change that on surface seems like going in the direction of what automakers want, but because this would be a policy change, nothing really changed in the environment, in the, in the economic environment, in the, in the climate, on the climate change front, uh, it's just a simple policy change unrelated to the external shocks, the automakers said, no, please don't do that because it's just, it's just, it's just bad for our bottom line to have these policies changing over time. Okay, so we think policy stability is uh, something that that uh, people care about, and you can tell a lot of stories for why. So we, you know, if we had a voter who cares about those two aspects and she's making policies, uh, that would be a simple. Uh, single decision-making problem, but we assume that the voter delegates policy-making to parties and we'll make two assumptions. One is that parties are more informed, so they will, be, they will observe shocks to the environment uh, with you know, better precision than the voter. Uh, but we're also going to assume that parties are, may not share voters' preferences. Uh, so, you know, we can talk about this, why we make this assumption, but the simplest explanation is it's just realistic. We're going to allow parties to behave as if they were representing the voter, but their interesting preferences will be different than voters' preference. Okay. And basically that's going to be the setting, and we are going to ask simple questions. So we are going to first ask you know how will voter behave in this environment what kind of parties the voter will elect will we see the voter switching between parties will there be some stability in terms of uh, whom she elects um, we are also going to ask a question do elections discipline the parties so given that i'm assuming that parties don't see eye to eye with the voter i want to see whether in equilibrium they actually behave as if they were closer to the voter 
And finally, the, the main questions we are interested in uh, is, uh, are policies responsive to shocks? Are they too stable or too volatile? What, what will we see in terms of policy making in this environment? Okay. So just to give you a preview of what we are going to find, you know, I have this model where the voter delegates decision making to parties that do not see eye to eye. So even like in a static setting, you immediately know that there will be some distortions. The voter will not always be happy with the policies that are implemented. And we show that there will be two types of distortions. Sometimes policies will inefficiently stay in place. So the voter wants to change them, but the party in power doesn't want to change them. And sometimes policies will ineffic inefficiently change. The voter will want to change them, but the party in power will, uh, the voter would like to stay in place and the, the, the party in power will change the policy. So that's not like super surprising uh, given how I set up the story. Uh, the first sort of novel finding is that the voter will tend to elect the party that's more likely to leave the status quo unchanged. So what does it mean, you know, in the US context, for example, if taxes are going to be, if, that, if the cur currently we have high taxes, the voter will be more likely to elect uh, Democrats who are more pro-tax. And if the taxes currently are low, the voter is going to be more likely to elect Republicans who are against high taxes. Okay, we're going to call this status quo bias. And even though it might seem like this comes immediately from my assumption that voter cares about policy stability, it's, it's not going to be as easy as it sounds. It's, the, this result is a little bit more nuanced. Now, what's the last finding that, that I think is a big takeaway is that um, the behavior of the voter creates electoral incentives that exacerbate these delegation distortions. So we are not only not going to have that parties are not disciplined by elections, but they will behave less in line with what the voter wants. Okay, they will implement policies that are sometimes too, that are on, on, at the same time too unresponsive to the changing circumstances, but at the same time they will be too volatile. Okay. So elections are actually going to create a lot of uh, uh, distortions and welfare loss. And I'm going to show you that actually these distortions are especially pronounced when the voter needs delegation the most. So in situations in which the voter doesn't observe the state of nature and she really needs parties uh, to implement policies for her because they, they do observe the state of nature, that's going to be the situation where the parties are least in line with the voter. Okay. So it's going to be a sad story, but most of my papers have sad stories. So. Any questions so far? All right, so let me show you the model. Um, uh, the model is uh, very simple. We are going to have three players, a representative voter, I'm just going to call her a voter, M, and two parties, L and R. Time will be discrete, there will be infinite horizon and everyone discounts future by the same discount rate. And uh, the biggest simplifying assumption is that policy space will be binary. So there will be only two policies, capital L and capital R, left and right. Okay. We can talk about what happens if I relax this assumption. Uh, we have some ideas. Uh, this, this is a crucial assumption in a sense that it allows us to solve the model. It's going to be a stochastic uh, game. Um, without that, bad things happen. Okay, but I can assure you that I think this is not really driving any of the substantive results and we can talk about this later. Now, so what's the information? The voter will observe some signal, ST, just, just uh, lives in the real line and uh, parties will observe some other signal, which I'm going to call state of nature, theta T. And I'm assuming that these signals are related in the following way, that the state of nature is equal to voter signal plus some epsilon. So you can think about this that at the time of the election, voters see some signal S, uh, but then there's some additional shock that actually affects what state we are living in. Okay. Coronavirus comes and yeah. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions about S and Epsilon. I'm going to assume that they are independent over time and from each other. This simplifies the analysis uh, um, considerably. I'm going to assume they admit a PDF, F and G. I'm going to assume that those PDFs are symmetric around zero. 
with full support. So the thing that's going to be uh, important is that I'm going to make the model symmetric for most of the of the talk. It's just it just gives much cleaner intuitions and allows you to think what happens once you relax symmetry. But but um, that's important. And I'm going to assume that G is log concave, so the distribution of epsilon is log concave, which basically is, is, uh, means that um, the higher the state that the, the voter observes, the, sorry, the higher the signal she observes, the higher state she thinks uh, she faces. So nothing unusual. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, What's the, what's the decision making in a particular period? So each period will start with the previously implemented policy, which I'm going to call the status quo. So the first period starts with some status quo that, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, we just pick it. And then uh, the voter observes a signal. Then she votes either for the left or the right party. The party that's elected is the single decision maker in that period. So she observes the state and then implement a policy either L or R. And that's it, okay? So that's going to be the, the, the game basically. So status quo is in place in each period, the voter observes um, a state, the voter either votes for L or R, the elected party observes the true state and implements a policy. And this policy becomes the status quo for the next period. What are the payoffs? I'm normalizing payoff from L to zero for all place, players and states. And the payoff from R is like the simplest you can imagine. Um, a play, payoff from R for player I in, at time T will be just the state plus some bias, BI. Okay, so the higher the state, the more I like R versus L. Uh, and I have some threshold that determines when I prefer R, when I prefer L. Okay. So, Sorry, what did happen? Did I stop sharing? Yes, you. <laughs> I just uh, okay. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. So um, I, again, I want to make uh, the model symmetric um, as, uh, because that simplifies things. So, so I assume that BR is equal to minus BL, and it, it, I'm going to denote it by some B, the greater than zero, and I'm going to assume that BM is zero. So what does it mean? You know, the the median vo the, the voter lies at you know her sort of she doesn't have any additional ide ideology so she just followed theta if theta is positive she prefers r if theta is negative she prefers l um, and parties are symmetrically distributed symmetrically distributed around this preference so one party is more rightist than the median voter and one party is more leftist and i'm going to use uh, some um, terminology i'm going to say that party l is ideologically aligned with uh, alternative L, okay? And party R is ideologically aligned with uh, policy R. So what it means is it doesn't mean that, that they always prefer L or R, it just means that they have a slight bias in this direction as compared to the median voter. And finally, I'm going to assume that there's a cost of policy change. So this is like the simplest way to capture this, uh, this um, desire for policy stability. It's very crude, but, but we thought about other ways and, and we decided that's actually the, the best way to do, that, to do that. So we're going to assume that everyone, when the policy changes, incurs a cost C. And again, to make everything symmetric for now, this is the same C for everyone. Okay. Uh, Viola, the way that you define the model, there are no election incentives, right? If, in which sense? If I'm the left party, it doesn't matter whether I take this action or the other party takes this action, I get the same payoff. Uh, that, so uh, that's correct. So far, that's correct. So, so far, uh, the parties only care about what policy is implemented, mm -hmm. not who implements it. Mm -hmm. um, we also add, because it's interesting, realistic, and leads to, 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 to funny findings, we also allow for parties to have uh, preferences for being in office. So let's assume that pay, uh, parties obtain some small pay of O when in office. So now you get additional electoral incentives. 
But as you see, you know, electoral incentives in this model will come through two sources. One is the, from this O, but another one is I want me to be making decisions in the future because you are different from me. Okay. Any questions? Violetta, so uh, correct me. So if there is a change in conditions, then public or the voter would prefer flexibility and responsiveness, but otherwise he would prefer stability, right? Right, so so there will be some, you know, suppose that I'm currently at the, at, at the policy L and uh, the state is such that I like L and now if the state changes just a little bit, I want to stick up to L. And I'm only going to wanna go to R when the change is, the, 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 shock is sufficiently large. So if, if, if that is the case, then uh, in, the, in, the version, in that version of the model with incentives to be in the office, then uh, wouldn't it be you know, uh, natural to add a political campaign stage where parties send signals to their voters and to, to make them believe that Hey, I'm I'm going to change the policy, and it's because the state that you are not observing requires that. So, in a sense, this is justification or legitimization. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, so in the model, we are going to so so first of all, uh, most of the results will come through even if I allow the voter to observe the true state of nature. So even if I make theta equal to S, but okay. of course some results become more interesting when, when you don't. So in this situation, um, each, each, so it depends how I think about it. If I think about chip talk, if I allow the parties to, to use chip talk, and uh, they will definitely have an incentive to, uh, to lie very frequently, uh, as you will see, you know, like, uh, I want to show that the state is such that I, I and only I will be the one who will implement what you want. Um, so I think with chip talk we wouldn't really get anything interesting. Then I could try to, I don't know what you have in mind, you have in mind some sort of more um, costly talk or verifiable disclosure mm -hmm. or something like this. So in this model, um, would there will be always one party who will have an incentive to disclose the state. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, if 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 uh, we can go back to this question uh, once we see it, how the model works and see if there's anything okay. interesting. We have not the, the short answers. We have not thought about campaigns uh, at all. What we don't want to have, um, we don't want to have commitment. We don't want to allow parties to say this is what I'm going to implement, and be able to uh, stick to that um, because uh, first of all. I think the commitment just to a particular um, policy would not really help much. And second of all, so, so you could think about like a stage contingent commitment, but that would be really something I think unrealistic. So, so the crucial thing is there's no commitment here. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we have this game and uh, for most of the talk, I'm going to look at symmetric stationary mark of perfect equilibria. Okay, so by, by focusing on mark of perfect equilibria, I'm getting rid of possibly many, <laughs> we don't know, but you would guess many equilibria where you can have some strange punishments given that parties are long lived. Um, but that's, um, you know, we can talk about this. Uh, I, I'm not going to defend mark of perfect equilibria here, but we think it's a reasonable assumption. A symmetric, it's, it's, uh, the results are the sharpest, but we can later try to talk about <clears throat> what happens if we relax symmetry, uh, and sometimes I will relax it. Any questions? Okay, so let me start by- just... Yona, can I yes? ask you some, sorry. Yeah. I missed one, so the state is IID? I, the state, right. I'm assuming that everything, the state, everything is IID. So the state uh, is IID, and signal and epsilon are also independent from each other. Okay, so we can start thinking about what happens when the state is correlated over time, but that's the simplest setting you can start. With. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. And in particular, the action taken today does not affect the state tomorrow. That's that's also important. 
important in the sense that it simplifies the intuitions in the, the story. Okay, so uh, let me start by some, doing something very simple, which is let's suppose that I have a one shot uh, version of this game. So the voter sees some status quo, she sees some signal, she elects one party, this party implements the policy, payoffs are realized, the game ends. So in particular, in this, uh, in this uh, model, you know, there are no electoral incentives because once the party is reelected, once the party is elected, they don't have any future. So they just behave according to their preferences. And I want to see, you know, just what happens in this one-shot game. And in, in particular, I'm interested in what are the preferences of the voter over the parties. And that's going to be really useful for, for thinking about the full game. So let me show, draw you a picture. So suppose we are starting with, us, with the status quo L. Yeah, leftist policy is, is in place. So here you have um, the state of nature, theta. Uh, the median voter is at zero, the voter is at zero. And then she has some cost of policy change, which is positive C. So if you think about what she would like to do in terms of policy making, she would like to implement R only if the state is above C, okay? Why is it, you know, she prefers R when the state is above zero, but she has a cost of policy change. So she will only implement R if the state is high enough to compensate for the cost of policy change. Good. Well, what if she elects a party? Well, if she elects the um, a party, uh, if she elects party L, party L has her bliss point at B, but party L also takes into account the cost of policy change. So party L will change the status quo from L to R only if the state is higher than B plus C, okay? Makes sense, party L is more leftist, so she's less inclined to change the status quo. Well, sorry, <laughs> that's it. Um, Thank you very much. If there are no you have to <laughs> fill in the blanks yourself. As you see, it's simple because now the other party is on the other side. So we can do the same analysis for the other part. So, um, so what do we see? Of, you know, I'm assuming parties are uh, different than the median voters. So of course, they don't do what she would like to do. And what we see is that no matter which party she chooses, she, she faces a possibility that actually uh, she gets um, the wrong decision. So for example, if she choose party L, she, uh, might, uh, she, she might pay a cost of inefficient stability, which means that this, the status quo stays in place, even though the voter would like to change it. And if she selects party R, she faces a possibility of inefficient policy change that she wants to leave the status quo in place, but party R is just too eager to change it uh, and, and the policy changes. So those are the distortion deleg um, delegation distortions that I was telling you about. So there's nothing really um, exciting here. So now let's think about what the voter will do. Well, she will try to calculate the, her utility and the probabilities that she ends up in one of these inefficient uh, situations. So, um, Let's suppose that she gets a signal C, okay? So then this curve represents her beliefs about the true state of nature, okay? Because she, her, her belief is centered at her signal and I assume it's symmetrically distributed and it's, um, it's um, single peaked like this. So now from this picture, if you stare at it long enough, you will see that the probability that she ends up in one of these inefficiency regions is the same, which if you remember the utility function, I should, I should also draw uh, her um, utility here. Her utility is linear in theta and will cross the, uh, the X axis at C. So you see that in this particular situation that I drew here, she'll be indifferent between selecting R, R and selecting L. Okay, so that's going to be the signal that's, that makes her different between whom to elect. But if she gets a signal straight to the left, for example, she gets a signal zero, now she put it, her probability distribution puts more weight that she will find herself in an inefficient policy change if she elects party R. So now she really wants to avoid electing party R, she will elect party F. Okay, does it make sense? So what's happening here is um, she will have a threshold um, 
strategy where if the state is above C, she elects party L, and if the threshold, sorry, she elects party R, and if the threshold is below, if the state is below C, she elects party L. So as you see here, she has slight preference for the party that's ideologically aligned with the current status quo. Yeah, my, distribu my distribution of, of her signal was centered around zero. So she's more likely to get a signal in which she elects party aligned with the status quo than the other party. Okay. And if I do the same um, ana uh, analysis for uh, the other status quo, I'm going to get the following result that the voter exhibits status quo bias. For any signals minus CC, she elects the party that's ideologically aligned with the status quo. Okay. So, you know, if she gets a very, uh, very rightist signals, very leftist signals, she knows whom to elect. If I get a very rightist signal, I would like to elect the party right because more likely I would like to have the policy right. But for some uh, signals in between, minus C and C, she will elect the party that's ideologically aligned for, uh, with the status quo. So her voting will depend on the current status quo. Does that make sense? Now, this is going to be uh, very, uh, very important um, for uh, us moving forward. I want to just point out one thing to you. Um, the result that I got uh, depends on the fact that everyone has this cost of policy change, but it also do, uh, depends on the shape of this distribution that I drew for you. So the cost of policy change only makes the voter want to condition her electoral decision on what's the current policy, but it doesn't tell her how she should condition it. If, for example, I drew this picture differently, like if, for example, if I had a uniform distribution here over the state, she would always be indifferent. It's, it's easy to see that she would always be indifferent between both parties. And if we had some sort of single dipped locally uh, uh, distribution of the shocks, we uh, would get complete reversal of this result. Okay, so the result comes not only from the fact that we have the cost of policy change, but they also come from the natural assumption on the distribution of shocks that um, I'm more likely to believe that the state is close to my signal than that the state is far from, from my signal. Okay, so this is what I want you to remember, that the voter exhibits the status quo bias. And... You know, there are two types of delegation inefficiencies that I already showed you, inefficient stability, inefficient policy change, and a few observations that, that might be useful later on because they are either going to stay the same or change or they're going to drive some of the results. So let me mention them. So what do we see here? The status quo bias does not depend whether the voter is informed or not, okay? No matter how, uh, you know, how um, uh, in this picture here, how spread this distribution is or how tight this distribution is about the signal, I'm going to have exactly the same uh, result that for signals between minus C and C, the voter conditions her uh, electoral choice on the current policy. Of course, her, the, inten the intensity of her preferences at this point will be different depending how informed she is, but she will always have this bias. The status quo bias will increase in C, in the cost of policy change, so that's not super surprising. It's completely independent of B, so it's completely independent of how far away the parties are from the voter, okay? And all those inefficiencies in policymaking will disappear as, as uh, the parties become more similar to the voter, so that's also not super surprising. Yeah, but uh, parties uh, are, are close to the voter, then those inefficiencies in the picture here will become very, very small. And finally, of course, in a static model, nothing depends on the office motivation because there's once I'm elected, yeah, I don't have any other election. So I don't, you know, I do my policy making just uh, based on my preference. Okay, so let's move to the dynamic game. So what's going to happen in the dynamic game? So how do we solve the dynamic game? Well, so let's look at party R and let's think about how party R would behave uh, if she were in power, because that will determine what the voter will want to do. So suppose that um, the status quo is L, when will party R implement R? Well, she compares the payoff from 
R to the payoff from L. So what's the payoff from R? So it's theta plus B, but because the status quo is L, she has to pay the cost of policy change minus C, and then she has some continuation value. What, is, what does this continuation value depend on? Well, it, it will only depend on the policy that she implements because the state is IID, the elections uh, have not happened yet, so she can calculate the value of, um, of the, con so, but, but the status quo matters because the status quo might affect who gets elected and the status quo might affect also uh, the cost of policy changes, uh, of the future policy changes. So her continuation value will depend on the policy she implements. Okay, so here you see where IID-ness of my shocks comes in. I have just a very simple uh, continuation value. If she chooses L instead, well, her payoff is zero. She doesn't have to pay any ch policy, uh, cost of policy change. And again, she gets a continuation value, which is now, um, uh, which now depends which, which now is a different number because it, it, it's a continuation value from having L in place. Is this clear? Okay. So she writes herself, uh, you know, she has a slightly different problem when the status quo is R. The problem is basically the same, but the cost is only incurred if she decides to implement policy L. So her decision what to implement will depend on the status quo. Um, and now we can uh, rearrange the terms, so we put, can put all the continuation values on the other side, and we see that this is this is uh, what describes policy making by uh, party R. So the things in black, the expression in black, is what what the decision making she would make if she were um, in the static model. So this is what we saw in the picture, and this expression in red is just the difference in the continuation value between selecting option R and selecting option L. So this is just a number right now, okay? Which makes it actually, which makes, uh, makes the you know, game now much simpler. Now we realize that basically an equilibrium will be in threshold strategy. Each party will have some threshold that determines when they implement L, when they implement R. This threshold will be depending on the status quo but it's just a number. And basically just to, to, to gain an insight of what's going on in this equilibrium and how policies evolve over time, all I need to do is I need to characterize this threshold. I need to tell you, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it zero? Um, so, so, so my uh, job just became uh, much simpler. Okay. Um, I'm going to denote this, this difference, this threshold that I'm interested in by policymaking distortion. And I'm going to denote it by WR sigma. Sigma will, when, when you see sigma, this will illustrate, um, this will tell you that I'm talking about the voting distortion, policymaking distortion in a particular equilibrium sigma, because in principle, there might be many equilibrium. Okay, so, um, Basically, if you recall the picture that I had before, we know that in the dynamic game, the behavior of the parties and the preferences of the voter will look exactly the same. There will be some threshold. And the question now is, you know, is this threshold positive or negative? And given that I'm looking at, um, at symmetric equilibria, if the threshold is positive for one party, it's negative for another party. So the question I'm going to ask is, in which direction all these lines that I drew for you move? Do they, you know, do they move far away from each other or do they get closer to, to what the median voter wants? So here's the first uh, proposition. A symmetric equilibrium exists. And in any such equilibrium sigma, voter still exhibits the status quo bias. And it's exactly the same bias as before, meaning for all signals between minus C and C, she chooses the party that's ideologically aligned with the status quo. The voter, um, uh, voter's distortion is zero. So voter's preferences are exactly as, as they were in the static game. However, the policy-making distortions of the parties are not zero. And in particular, the policy-making distortion of party L is negative and party R is positive. What does it mean? On the picture, it means this. So the blue line, the thick blue line was the 
preferences uh, of uh, party L in a static model, so it had true preferences. And now in the dynamic model, her preferences shift away from the median voter. And the same is true for party R, they shift away from the median voter. So parties become more polarized, if you will, in their policy making uh, than what they, you know, ideologically are. What's the consequence of that? Both delegation distortions become bigger. Now we have more policy stability if we elect the party that's aligned with the status quo and more unnecessary policy change if we elect the other party that's misaligned with the status quo. So what's the intuition for that? The intuition is actually very simple. It comes from the static model because the voter has a status quo bias. Now each party, when they select which policy to implement, they have this extra incentive to implement the policy that they are ideologically aligned with because that gives them a higher probability of being in power tomorrow. Yeah, so if I'm the leftist party, I get this additional incentive to implement policy L because that, in case this, the signal is between minus C and C tomorrow, assures that I'm going to be re-elected. Okay, and why do I want to be re-elected? So as Arda said, there are two reasons. First of all, I have office motivation, but second of all, I want to be in power and make my own decision making, and even more so because now I know that in equilibrium, your decision making is actually very different from mine. So I want to make sure I'm in power. Does that make sense? So putting it in some sort of applied terms, I'm basically telling you that if taxes are high, voters are more likely to reelect uh, Democrats than Republicans. And as a result, Democrats have even more incentives to keep taxes high. Any questions? So I, I, I'm, I think I'm missing something with this logic and I'm going to try to sort of describe it to you and you'll tell me where I'm feeling wrong. It feels like there is some sort of strategic substitutability in the party strategies in the sense that if I'm the rightmost party and if mm -hmm. I see the left party being more extreme, mm -hmm. right? I am more worried about that party. So I will try to appeal to the voter and try to get more central. Am I? Um, maybe I'm... Very good, very good. No, so, so there, there's this, there's this comp I, I think I would call it complementarity here, but you know, it depends how you flip yeah. the signs. Yeah. So, so, you, so suppose, suppose we forget about the office motivation and all motivation that I have as a party is to, to have someone who is similar to me making decisions in the future, okay? You, you are rightly to point out that if I see my opponent polarize more, I'm even more inclined to want to make sure that, that in, in, I'm in office tomorrow. How do I make sure that I'm in office? Your, your intuition tells you, I ensure that but becoming uh, like the voter. That would be the correct inference if the party could commit. If the party could commit to her strategy, say, I'm going to, to, to be, so, you know, if you think about the downshine model where I commit to my positions, that would be defined. In this model, the party cannot commit. So after they're elected, they do whatever they do. And the only thing that they realize is that, that um, because they cannot commit, the voter will have the status quo bias that they select the party with higher probability, uh, they select the party that's more aligned with the status quo. So Thank that you. gives me, so, so now actually the fact that you are becoming polarized makes me even more wanna polarize because I wanna keep my preferred status quo to assure re-election. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, so, um, 
this is important. This is this is this is basically you know the main thing that drives all the remaining results. So if you have any questions, that's the right time to ask. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is I wanna do some comparative statics on this delegation distortions. Um, uh, so the first thing to notice is uh, there might not be a unique equilibrium. Even if I restrict my attention to symmetric equilibria, there might be multiple equilibria. And this is what, you know, this is following from Arda's comment. If suppose that, you know, I think you distort your behavior a little bit and I distort, then I have an incentive only to distort my behavior a little bit because I care about you not making decisions for me, but I don't care so much. After all, we are not so far apart. But if for some reason I believe you are going to distort your behavior a lot and you're going to be super rightist in your decision making, now I don't want you to make decisions for me. I want to be in power. And the only way I can be in power is if I defend my leftist status quo. So if parties behavior feeds off each other and you can see how we could generate multiple equilibria with small distortions or large distortion. So, so let's focus on the smallest and the, on, on the least and the, uh, most distorted equilibrium. So I'm going to, you know, order all equilibrium, we can show that there exists an order. We can order all equilibria from the smallest to the largest uh, distortion. And we can do comparative statics on those equilibria. So what do we have? Well, in any, in the least or most distorted equilibrium, this vo these distortions actually increase. So parties become even more polarized um, as parties ideological bias increases, as the cost of policy change increases, and as the patience goes up. So what's going on here? So the first two are pretty, uh, pretty uh, important, pretty sort of in intuitive. If you and I do not see eye to eye already in a static world, it's more important for me to be in power, not to make sure, not to make sure that you are not making my decisions. So it's more important for me to take advantage of the status quo bias of the voter. Okay, so I'm becoming more, I, I'm distorting my policy making more. If the cost of policy is large, um, then the voter is more likely to uh, have this, uh, to have a signal that actually makes her uh, exhibit status quo bias. Yeah, so if, if you remember that the status quo bias is in the region minus CC, uh, so the higher the C, the more um, likely it is that the voter just selects the party that's aligned with the status quo and ignores her signal. Uh, so I want to, again, uh, distort my policy making in that direction. The last one is a little bit interesting because, you know, we have many results where we think uh, patience is a good thing. If parties are patient, good things will happen. Here we have the opposite. If parties are patient, then we actually have large distortions. And the logic is, you know, now pretty obvious. The more I care about who is in power tomorrow, the more I distort my policy making. Because the, the only distortions come from the fact that I want to be in power tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so if you want to look at the welfare of the voter, intuitively it decreases in all these parameters. Okay, so, so now what, what do I want to do? I want to do a few, you know, sort of comparative statics exercises. So the first one is about voters' information. So I said that we assume that parties are more informed than the voters. So it's only natural to ask, how, how, does those, how do those distortions uh, change with voters' information? So here's the proposition that we have. Fix the distribution of the state. Okay, so I'm keeping the distribution of the state unchanged. Consider the least and the most distorted equilibrium sigma in a game with somewhat informative signal. So I'm right now in my game. I pick, let's say, the least distorted equilibrium sigma. And now consider a game in which the signal is completely uninformative. So let's sigma hat be the least distorted equilibrium in a game with informative signal. Okay, so I'm changing informativeness of the signal, and I'm always picking the least distorted equilibrium in these two games. What I can show you is that the distortions 
will be higher in equilibrium sigma hat than in equilibrium sigma. This prime shouldn't be here on the slide. What does it mean? In the, in the game in which the voter doesn't have any signal, the signal is completely uninformative, she will face higher distortions than in an equilibrium in which she has some information. So that's actually pretty bad because, you know, if when she doesn't have information, she's punished twice. First of all, she doesn't have information about what she will want this period. So she cannot tailor her election to uh, the state. But second of all, the poli policymakers that she elects behave in a very polarized way. So she gets policymaking that's not responsive to her preferences uh, as much as she would like to. The reason for this finding is exactly, you know, stemming again from the same finding at the beginning that the voter has a status quo bias. If her signal is between minus C and C, uh, she selects the part that's aligned with the status quo. If her signal is uninformative, she always selects a party that's aligned, that's aligned with the status quo. So now the incentives for the parties uh, to have the aligned status quo are very high. Does that make sense? Okay, so this we thought it was... Can, it, uh, huh? can I ask you something? Of course. Um, how about the following? Um, so your cost of change, C, is constant. Um, how about it's, uh, it's a function of history? In particular, if I had a left policy in the last four periods, now changing to right is more costly than the situation in which I had left for one period. So the longer string of a policy you are exposed to, more costly it is to change. Yes. Would that uh, change some of your results? That's interesting. So, so let's think about it. So, um, so suppose that the status quo is left today. And now uh, the leftist party well, so, so, so let me, let me just, just um, make your question simple. So, of course, if I'm changing the cost, I'm changing also like the, the utilities of everyone. But let's assume that the cost for the voter changes on. Yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so then it's easier. So now I'm the, the leftist party. See, left is in, in place. I want to put left um, in place tomorrow because of this status quo bias. But I have this extra effect that tomorrow I know the status quo bias will be even larger. Do I want to do that or not? I think that's actually not, the answer to this question is actually not obvious. Yeah. So if I think about uh, office motivation only, then probably this, this force will, will push me into saying, yes, I want left today even more because I want, uh, then I have an easy way to stay in power. I just keep on yeah. putting left. Uh, but the problem is that I know that as the cost for the voter increases, the stat her status bias uh, increases, and then the parties polarize more. And I might not want to go there. Yeah. Um, and so from I the voter's perspective, yeah. voter may foresee that, you know, if he sticks to the same thing for a long time, if one day, for valid reasons, if he needs to change, the cost will be so high, maybe he goes for more frequent changes. Uh, so what, what? So you're saying voters' uh, voters' uh, behavior would change? Um, yeah, you're right. That vote now we also have to think about the voter. She knows yeah. her cost will go up, and yeah. and so yeah. So it's a good question, and I'm I'm guessing you're you think it's a reasonable assumption. Like you think about. I thought like, that longer you stick or, to the same guys, you know, you know, you start to have infrastructure and establishment and you know the ways of doing business you know you adapt to it and longer it is you get used to it and one day if things change then it's harder for you yes so it's a good question we have to think about it and i think it's especially good because you know right now we just have a cost of policy change that occurs automatically 
in the back, sort of like in the back of our mind, we have a model in mind where you decide whether to, in, you know, policy changes, you can incur a cost to sort of make this policy change more beneficial to you. And then how long you think the policy will stay in place will determine whether you incur this cost. So I think there are some interesting things to explore okay. there. So thanks for the question. So I think the answer is actually not obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Thank I you. thought. Thank you. Okay, so let me talk about office motivation a little bit. Uh, so um, in general, you know, when you look at the literature on political accountability and so on, you, you, in the, the general finding is that the more office motivated parties are, the, the more good things happen, the more in line their policy making is with the voter. There are some, you know, papers that show the other way around, but they are, you know, they are usually about pandering. I want to be in the office, so I pander to my voter and I tell them what they want to hear, independent of what information I have. But in general, the, the, there's this finding that office motivation is good and policy motivation is bad for uh, the voter. So what happens in our model, you can probably already predict it because, again, the intuition stems from this first finding that we have. So here's the proposition. In the least distorted equilibrium, the, the policymaking distortions W sigma increase in office motivation. So the welfare of the voter decreases in office motivation. And again, the intuition is the same. If, if, we ha if parties have high office motivation, they want to exploit the status quo bias of the voter and they distort their policy making behavior even more in favor of the aligned status quo. Okay. So this is, this is um, a finding that goes in the opposite direction to most of the findings in political economy. And even it gets even worse. So let me, uh, let me uh, do the foreign comparative statics. So suppose that office motivation can be higher than the bias. If you, if you have good memory, you rem remember that I was assuming the opposite inequality. Uh, it's just, um, when I assume this inequality, I have more equilibria, but I can get rid of them. So, so let's forget about these technicalities that I'm not showing you. Let's suppose that this is possible. And let me do the following uh, experiment, fix office motivation at some level and take uh, biases, BK to be a, so let's take a sequence of biases such that the biases go to zero as K goes to infinity. Okay, so I'm now make, uh, taking a series of games where the parties become closer and closer to the voter in terms of ideology. And now let's WK be a sequence of the corresponding policy making distortions. Uh, let's say, you know, pick any sequence. So I have par uh, biases BK, pick one equilibrium, the uh, distortions in this equilibrium are WK. And I wanna see what happens with those distortions as parties become closer and closer to the voter. And what we can show is that these distortions are bounded away from zero. So even if I make parties infinitesimally um, uh, different from voters, so like as arbitrarily close to the voters, to the voter, as long as they have office motivation, they will have voting, they will have policy making distortions. Okay, so we find, you know, that this is interesting. The, the reason is again, the same. If I'm, making the parties very similar to the voter. The voter doesn't have very strong preference between which party to elect. So if the voter believes that parties behave according to their preferences, she doesn't have a strong preference, but she still has non-zero preference. She still always has a strict preference between one party or the other. So as soon as her signal is uh, between minus C and C, so her signal doesn't strongly suggest that she should prefer one party over the other, she goes with the party that's aligned with the status quo. And as soon as she goes with the party that's aligned with the status quo, parties have an incentive to distort their policy making in favor of this, of their aligned status quo. Does it make sense? So we, I mean, you know, once you, once you have the basic model, it's a sort of obvious finding, but we think it's an interesting finding because if you, you know, I started this, uh, presentation by saying parties do not see eye to eye with the voter, you know, you might like or dislike this assumption, but what we can show is that even if the parties do see eye to eye 
almost do see eye to eye with the voter in equilibrium, they will behave as if they didn't. Okay. So I already mentioned this, that this is a different finding. Um, now, um, uh, so um, feel free to stop me. You know, it's it's. I I think I've covered like the most important things, but let me just just show you a few uh, findings that are interesting. You can you can think about this office motivation, and you can say, well, in light of that, you know, what what do I know about parties wanting to actually tell the voters about their motivation? Suppose that somehow they would try to convey some information that we don't fully model this this game, but you know, like intuitively, you can think, you know, would parties want to be perceived as office motivated? or would they like to be perceived as actually policy motivated? So we, we have the following finding. This finding, uh, we were able to derive only in a setting in which the voters are uninformed. So she gets signal uh, zero uh, always. Um, so let P of P and conditional Q be the probability that P is elected under Q. So party P is elected under Q in equilibrium signal. If the office motivation of both parties are the same, then in this game in which the voter doesn't get any signal, she always selects the party aligned with the status quo. So the probability that party L is selected under L is equal to one and probability that party R is selected under R is one. Now, what happens when we make one party, let's say party right, more office motivated? We can show that it's still true that when the status quo is leftist, party left gets selected. But the probability that party R gets elected under status quo R goes to zero as the office motivation of party R goes to infinity. So what, that, what am I showing you? As, as party R becomes more and more office motivated, she actually gets uh, elected with smaller and smaller probability. Okay. And you can see, you can see uh, why. If the, if the rightist party is very much office motivated, then if the voter always elects this party when the status quo is right, this party will be extremely biased. She will only implement right. So the incentives of the voter to elect her would be low. So we are going to have some mixed equilibrium where actually the voter has to elect this party less and less frequently to give her less incentive to actually uh, always implement R, the irresponsive to the shocks. Okay. So in our model, the party would like to hide the fact that they are office motivated. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to think about the value of elections. So um, here's, here, here's our thinking. So um, in our model, you know, election, elections are good. Um, on the one hand, because the voter gets some signal and she can tailor whom she elects based on her signal. But on the other hand, it's the elections that provide bad incentives for um, the parties to behave once they are in office. So if you, if you thought about you know, how voters should behave to provide incentives for the parties, you would like, the, if, if voter could commit, the voter probably would commit to some other uh, election rules. Probably, probably the voter would, you know, maybe the voter would like to say, I'm just electing parties at random, or maybe she would like to flip her rule and maybe she would like to elect a party that's misaligned with the status quo to just make those parties come closer to, to her preferences. So we were trying to, to ask questions of this sort. So the way we ask them is um, uh, as follows. So the first question we ask is, does the voter prefer elections to being a sole decision maker? Okay. So here, so basically the question is, are the distortions in this model high enough that the voter actually would prefer to just make decisions even though she's uninformed uh, instead of having elections? And the second question we ask is, does the voter prefer to commit to one party? Okay, so suppose that instead of having elections, I say, okay, party right is always going to represent me. Uh, you know, it's, it's a theoretical question, but you can think about this question approximating a question about how long should the electoral cycle be. If I have elections every period, it's like I, I'm in my game, but if I have elections every 10 periods, I'm sort of committing to one party for a while, so I'm taking away this electoral incentives from this party for a while. The question is, would I want to do that? 
So here, you know, my, uh, I have like partial results, but I'm presenting them mainly just to get a sense, you know, whether you think they are worth exploring. So the, so the first proposition says that suppose that the vote is uninformed. So that's the setting we can analyze. Um, she always strictly prefers elections to being a sole decision maker. Okay, so the distortions are not large enough to make her wanna be the decision maker. But there exist parameters for which she prefers one party to indefinitely, uh, to be indefinitely in power to elections. Okay, now I'm not, that's what I'm saying, the results are partial. I'm not telling you what these parameters are because we have only partial characterization and you know, I don't wanna bore you with complicated characterization, but, but we can show that there are parameters for which she prefers to have one party in power and there are parameters for which she prefers elections. And, and we are wondering whether we should explore it further and have this characterization fully. Um, but we find, it, we find it sort of interesting, so we might go in this direction uh, because that tells you something about how frequent the elections should be. Under what circumstances you wanna have frequent elections under what you don't. Any questions? So the basically in the last case, what the voter is doing is that she is trading off information versus bias. Exactly. Way, right? Exactly. And um, so, go ahead. Uh, I I don't know. So in the first case, she trades information versus bias in the in the first bullet point. The second, the second bullet point, you know, I have information that I have someone representing me yeah. under elections and under only one party being in power. So I make sure that someone is using full information to make decisions. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, uh, so the meeting, I'm, um, if I have elections, I create this distortionary incentives. If I don't have elections, the party just behaves according to her preferences. So that's a benefit of choosing uh, the game with one party being in power all the time. What's the cost? The cost is that, um, the cost here? If, if I didn't make this assumption about uh, the voter being uninformed, I would know the answer to this question, but I made this assumption, so now I'm thinking. <laughs> because you see, if, if, sorry, if I, remo if, if I remove the first sentence that I have this in this proposition, uh, the cost would be that now I'm disregarding my information about uh, whom I actually wanna have in power, and I'm always having the same person in power. So maybe I, I shouldn't have this, uh, I don't, now I'm, I'm a little bit uh, confused. Maybe I shouldn't have this uh, qualification in my proposition. I have to go back, double check. I made those slides a while ago, sorry. <laughs> um, let me think, uh, is there any? Because if I'm uninformed, I always follow. No, 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 I tra I'm trading, sorry, I'm trading, sorry. No, 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 uh, this is correct. I'm still, I still have a trade-off. So why, why don't I wanna have the same party in power? Because, you know, even suppose that I have party R in power. Sometimes this party will implement policy L, yeah? Yeah. When this party implements policy L, I know that this party next period is very likely to shift the policy back to R because, you know, this party is, is, is rightist. And in this situation, I actually don't want this to happen. I would like party L to be my policy maker. So I'm, I'm basically uh, sacrificing the, I'm, I'm by having the same party in power, I'm sometimes uh, sacrificing the flexibility to make sure that I don't have unnecessary policy changes. Yeah. Now, if on top of that, I relax the thing on the top, which we would like to relax if we were to you know, take seriously this proposition, then there's this additional effect that now I have information which party I would like to have in place, in power, and I'm completely uh, not allowing myself to make decisions based on this information. So exposed, once I elect, once I, once, once, if, once I figure out what's your behavior, I would like to always have access to elections. That's definitely true. But unfortunately, my access to elections affect your behavior and I might want to commit myself not to, not to elect, have elections in order to 
affect your behavior. Okay. Okay, so um, we have some results. I'm not going to go over them, uh, but we, we ask questions. What if the cost of policy change is different? Meaning what if parties um, actually don't incorporate the cost of policy change? Uh, or what if actually they have higher cost of policy change than the voter? And you can tell story for both. And I don't know if you have any sort of good examples that come to your mind, we would be, would be um, eager to take them. You know, the way we think about it is sometimes politicians do not really fully incorporate the cost of policy change or the fact that, that voters have to, you know, uh, hire new consultants and rewrite their, you know, accounting practices in the companies and so on. But on the other hand, we can find ourselves in a situation in which, uh, you know, the cost of policy change is the legislative cost. It's just hard to negotiate with the other party and like it's hard to write a new bill and so on. You have better things to do. You can go on uh, Twitter and uh, so, you know, Facebook and, and have some fun. So, so we don't know empirically which way, which assumption makes more sense. Um, we would like to think about this a little bit more carefully, but so far this is uh, where we are. But what we find is that uh, the voter will try to sort of um, undo the discrepancy. So if the parties have a, low cost of policy change, lower than the voter, the voter will exhibit even higher status quo bias, okay? So if the parties are eager to make policy changes, the voter will, for more signals, she will elect the party aligned with the status quo because she wants to make extra sure that the policy doesn't change. So that will lead to higher distortions. Well, On the other hand, if you make the system, if you make the system such that it's hard for parties to change the policy, the voter will actually exhibit low status quo bias, which will make parties more aligned with the voter. Well, Viola, so the type of analysis that you are doing here is that if I'm the left party, uh, changing the policy from right to left costs something and left to right also costs something, right? Yes. So the way yes. that you were describing it, I think a more sensible one is that if I'm the left party, the cost of changing from right to left is lower, I guess. Why? So what kind of cost are you thinking that would make this assumption reasonable? Uh, okay, good. Um, so following up with your sort of example about consultants and etc., maybe you are better prepared to sort of prepare policies that are ideologically aligned with your pre-existing positions. So you can come up with easy ideas easier, you can implement them easier and etc. Um yeah we, we could we could have that. So if we had that um uh I think that the, 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 the most of the results would come through. Perhaps there will be some additional comparative statics with like what happens when you make this asymmet more asymmetric. I don't know, I would have to think about this. Um, I mean, what's definitely true is that you can, you can generate similar, um, similar results, similar dynamics in the model in which you just assume that the leftist party is better at governing with policy L and the rightist party is better at governing policy right. And, and there are models like this, no? Like we perceive, um, let's say Republican party to be better when there are, uh, when there's war. And we, you know, think that the, the Democrats are better when there's a peace, a peace time. So that gives also parties incentives to distort their um, policies towards the things that they are better at. Um, but you know, we don't want to go there. These models exist. We just we just thought that we take the cost of policy change seriously, and we see that we get similar dynamics here. Okay, so the uh, the last uh -huh. just, Violetta, uh, just one question: um, if there was some uncertainty mm -hmm. about uh, parties' costs, okay. Mm -hmm. Would they have an incentive to signal it or reveal it correctly to the voter? Very 
Good. So suppose, so that to make the simplest... Uh, yeah, high know, cost, simplest, low cost. Yeah, and, and suppose that uh, both parties have the same cost. It's just the voter doesn't know. Um, again, my, my guess is that they would prefer to signal that they have a high cost. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being that, um, I mean, so, so if you remember the picture that I, I had, if, um, no, so I think, I think it would be a really complicated uh, uh, question because, you know, suppose the status quo is left, okay? Mm -hmm. If I'm the rightist party, I would actually want to say, um, you know, I don't have any cost of, uh, of, of uh, yeah. policy change because I want to be close. Uh, so was it right? One party, one party would like to pretend I don't have any cost of policy change because that makes me closer to you. The other party would like to say I have a huge cost of policy change because that would make this party closer to the, to the policy maker. Yeah. So I think it would be, um, I think we wouldn't have any information revelation uh, there uh, if, they, if they were just uh, cheap talking if they could reveal, then you would probably get some unraveling there. But it's a complicated question to ask because we have this dynamic game where like in the game, I would learn eventually what's happening. And I don't think I can solve a game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a good question about, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so the last thing I want, just want to mention is uh, because, you know, these are the questions that you should have in mind. So how, you know, I made this very stark assumption that there are just two policies, left and right. In reality, I have, you know, many policies uh, to choose from. And how, how do those results carry uh, over? So we can't solve a game with, in, with more than two policies. Um, realistically, for various reasons, uh, tractability, but also even like the existence of equilibrium is, is um, gets complicated and we can go into details. But so which, what, what we decided to do instead is we decided to look at the two period example with a more general policy space. So suppose that policy space now is a real line, I can choose any policy Y. And uh, so suppose now my preferences of course have to be more complicated. Suppose that every player wants the policy to match the state plus the bias, okay? So I have single peak preferences. We get rid of curvature. We don't wanna have complications with curvature. So it's just, you know, absolute value. Um, and I have a peak at the state minus bias. Now, the second thing we have to also decide uh, what to assume is, um, is what's the cost of policy change. If we have ma many policies now, we can have many different costs. For example, the cost can depend on the size of the policy change. It can be convex, concave. So again, here we wanted to do this as simple as possible because we don't know what would be the reasonable assumption. Um, so we just assume that there's still a fixed of cost of policy change. I, I, you know, it's sort of the first order approximation, especially if you think that you know, there's some fixed cost of policy change and then the cost is variable. So here's the model, yeah? So, uh, I want to match the state uh, plus my bias, and I have a fixed cost of policy change. And here we know what we can tell you is that, uh, and, and this should be relatively intuitive, that we still have the status quo bias. Okay, so we still have the situation that, uh, uh, you know, when I get a signal somewhere close to zero, I, I'm more likely to agree with the party who wants to leave the status quo in place than with the party who wants to move it. So I'm still going to select the party who wants to leave the status quo in place. Once I have the status quo bias, then you know that there are those electoral incentives to exacerbate, um, um, that exacerb that is electoral incentives that make me wanna bias my policy making. How do I bias my policy making? Well, it's not true that I wanna bias them to the extreme, that if I'm the rightist party, I wanna choose the extreme right uh, policy. Why? Because if I choose the extreme right policy, the voter knows that it's very likely that everyone would like to change this policy tomorrow. It's a very unlikely situation in which I like this extreme policy tomorrow. So in this situation, both parties will be changing the policy and because they are symmetric uh, with respect to my ideal point, I don't care whom I elect. So actually electing an extreme policy doesn't give you electoral advantage. 
but electing a policy that's a little bit more rightist, uh, it does, okay? Because then it's more likely that the voter will select the party that's aligned with this more lightest policy. So what we can show is that there, ex there will exist a policy Y star, which is positive, such that the rightist party will distort her policies towards Y star, and the leftist party will distort her policies towards L star. So we are going to have this polarization, but only to a certain extent. If the state is extremely extreme, we, uh, we, uh, extremely extreme <laughs> we are going to have moderation. Okay, so this is going to be one thing that's going to be more nuanced in this model. But similarly, office motivation will lead to distortions even under minimal ideological polarization. So we think this is, this is uh, you know, this is going to go through in the two period model. So we think it would be a strange to believe that it would go away in the infinite horizon model. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's all. So what are the conclusions? Okay, so, you know, I skipped the literature, which I usually very impolitely do. So, you know, whom do we speak to? We, we speak to this literature on do elections discipline politicians because we have elections in our model. And as I said, most of the literature says yes. We fall then in the literature that says, well, in certain environments, it's the opposite. Um, we, you know, um, we are related to the literature that I mentioned a second ago where policies chosen today affect whom voters prefer tomorrow. So we might have a situation where, again, if, if uh, parties decide to go to war, then voters prefer Republicans because they have reputation for dealing better with wars. Uh, so, so those models generate similar dynamics. We fall into this category. Uh, finally, you know, self-promotion, we are related to our previous work where we look at responsiveness of policies to changing circumstances, but we, here we, we assume that cost, uh, there's a cost of policy change, we have elections, so there, there's much to, uh, you know, there's difference between our previous work. And finally, there's, uh, there are a few papers that came out recently, we all started working <laughs> independently on the question of policy making where policy changes are costly. Uh, so so yeah, this is something that, as I said, has been neglected by this literature for a while, and we think it's, uh, it's actually an important factor in policy making. Okay, so conclusions. Um, what do I want you to take away? Well, so I want you to take away that if voters care about policy responsiveness and stability, which I think is a reasonable assumption, then elections will not discipline even office motivated parties. Parties will behave as if they were more ideologically distant from the voters. So the policies will be on the one hand too stable, like they will just not respond to the environment, but at the end they will change too frequently, even though the environment uh, didn't change uh, sufficiently um, to justify a policy change. Distortions will be most pronounced when the voter needs to delegate the policy making the most. So that's said. And, and the final thing is if you think about elections, you, are, you should be observing this tendency of voters to elect parties that are aligned with the current status quo. Okay. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Riona, one thing that I'm wondering, I mean, one thing at the root at this, of this problem is basically the inability of the parties to commit, right? So all of these things about office motivation, et cetera, it goes through the, your baseline assumption that you cannot commit. Yes. I wonder if there is a way of parameterizing the party's commitment power so that this thing sort of, so you can parse the two extremes. Uh, basically, we know, already know based on like standard models what happens in one extreme and in your model it's the other extreme. But I'm not aware of models of like partial commitment that allows you to sort of parameterize and I mean, so we, what we could, what we could do, so, so it depends on what you, how much you want, how much commitment you want to allow. Uh, so if you um, allow state dependent commitment, so I can commit on theta to mm -hmm. theta. Um, I think it's pretty obvious in this model that uh, you get uh, convergence. And for most parameters, like regional parameters, you would get that every party says, I'm, um, I commit to being exactly like you voter. 
Okay. Now, this is a little bit too much. I think that's completely unreasonable. The reason why we have elections is because, you know, like, we don't even know what's the state of nature. We want someone smarter to make decisions for us. So what if I allow them to commit to the policy? So I could parameterize it by saying, I say that I'm committing to, po to policy R and with some probability P I'm committed, with some probability one minus P I'm actually not. Um, what would happen in this model? Uh, would I want to exercise this commitment? I think, okay, so I don't want to lie to you, but I th and I I'll, I'll think about this, but I think actually I would not want to exercise this kind of commitment. Because right now, if you are the voter and you elect the right, I think I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm telling the truth. If, you, if you're the voter and I'm the rightist party, you already know I have a bias towards right. Even in the static model, as, as opposed to you, I have a bias towards right. Um, but you are still happy that this bias is not infinite and sometimes I will implement left. When I implement left, you are actually happy because you already want left. So my, me committing to right is actually making me less attractive. So I think neither voters, no, neither, neither, I think parties would not want to commit and I think voters would be happy that parties are, parties are not committed in this world. So it's sort of, so, so maybe, so that's a good point. So maybe I'm actually understanding our results. So it's not only that there's a lack of commitment that leads to those results, but, but no one would want this kind of commitment unless we allow for state contingent commitment. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, Vila, you said you cannot solve this model when you have, uh, you know, other than left and right. So you you have more than two uh, policies. Mm -hmm. So it's like you cannot solve it for like you know three policies. It's not possible or it's not tractable. Is I mean, it, uh, uh, okay. So for any finite number of policies, I can try to solve it. Huh. Um, it's it's going getting nasty. Um, the the problem starts is so if I so the problem the problem starts being if I allow single picked, um, uh -huh. you know if 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 like we we look at this question like if I have well, just three policies but my preferences are always such that either I I prefer either the the most right righties or the most leftists things are easy. Once I have single picked policies, the problem becomes is that uh, is, is that continuation values are not nicely behaved, and the reason is mm -hmm. the one that I was trying to uh, describe to you that even though as a right party I want to distort my process to the right, I don't want them to destroy to distort them too much to the right. Because when I distort them too much to the right, they don't give me any benefit because everyone knows that they are not going, no one is going to like those policies tomorrow. So my continuation value will be some, something like, you know, I have a peak somewhere here and then I have a dip again. And I have, like, it's going to be just um, not well behaved. And our understanding is that um, we don't even have any existence results for this game mm -hmm. at, that, at that point. We have this paper by Dagan and Kalandrakis in like JET, I think 2012, where they try to, in a slightly different model, but sort of like the, 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 the basic uh, you know, legislative bargaining idea was the same. They try to prove um, uh, existence, but then they have to perturb the model, like they have to add a lot of noise. And at the end of the day, you, you just lose characterization completely. I see. So I was gonna, you know, I was thinking. Uh, I had, I remember having this um, idea when I was taking, like, you know, Bart's or Steve's class. Uh, <laughs> you know, old days. In old days, I took like, you know, uh, two classes in political economy. Like some, I, I was thinking something like, you know, so suppose you have five uh, left uh, policies and five right policies, and the representative voter is like has like something like intransitive indifference in the sense that. Like he's indifferent between, for example, left one and left two, but he's not indifferent between left one and left three. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so you can, um, and the question is like, you know, is would it be possible to go extremes? Like, would it be possible for parties to go like, you know, like, you know, state by state, like, will there be, will there exist like Marco Perfect or whatever, Equilibria, where these parties are gonna like, you know, uh, 
kind of being a little bit ambiguous and uh, change the policy towards like a rightist party is going to make it like you know more and more and more right and you know keeping the representative water indifferent between two things like you know step by step and keep like you know uh, and my my gut uh, the times were different then my gut intuition was like it wouldn't be possible now I'm thinking that you know looking at real life I'm thinking it, it, might, <laughs> it might be possible so uh, I don't know. So this is. Um... I mean, so I'm not saying that all the models with continuum of, of um, policies are not solvable. But the thing that complicates things is the shocks. Mm -hmm. You know. So so that if you look at the literature, so the J Jackson's papers here, Jackson had uh, where, they, where do I have the literature? Yeah. Um, you know, like this uh, the Gersbach Muller to had, Gersbach Jackson to had, and so on. They solve actually Infinite Horizon games with. Uh, with very similar settings, but they basically don't have, they have basically static transferences with some caveats, but so that's what complicates the, the, the game. So maybe you could still solve your game and tell us why we have polarization. Thank you, Well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think we are running out of time. So Viola, thanks a lot for giving this presentation. We really appreciate your Thank time. you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. Oh, and we hope